Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. Paris Schutz will join us later in the program. On the show tonight, Paris details his investigation into a company that donated more than $100,000 to funds connected to Illinois GOP candidate Richard Irvin. That company got millions in city contracts. I know that I'm in exactly the right place at the right time. It's official. The 11th Ward has a new alder person. Meet City Council's newest member, Nicole Lee. A look at what the latest Omicron subvariant may mean for Chicagoans. And as millions of Ukrainians flee Russia's invasion, some refugees have already found their way to Chicago. We look at how they're being helped. But first, some of today's top stories. Amid growing inflation and international instability, President Joe Biden says the 2023 budget proposal he unveiled today highlights three principles, fiscal responsibility, safety and security, as well as investments to build a better America. My dad had an expression. He said, don't tell me what you value. Show me your budget. <clears throat> I'll tell you what you value. Don't tell me what you value. Show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you value. Well, the budget I'm releasing today sends a clear message to the American people that we what we value. Biden's plan includes a new tax on the wealthiest Americans, directing those worth more than $100 million to pay at least 20 percent of their total income in federal income taxes. Investments include $10 billion over 10 years for states and local officials to safeguard the integrity of election processes through additional personnel and equipment. Biden's budget also includes $30 billion in mandatory spending for state and local law enforcement, crime prevention and community violence intervention. Today, the Illinois State Police held the first meeting of its Forensic Science Commission, which is responsible for ensuring the swift collection, delivery, and analysis of forensic evidence. Illinois State Police Director Brendan Kelly says hiring additional forensic analysts and utilizing robotics over the years has helped reduce backlogs of the following forensic evidence from February 2019 to the end of 2021. He cites a 52% decrease in the time used for analyzing firearms, 56% in processing toxicology results, a 60% drop in the time for analyzing biological evidence like DNA, a 62% decrease for trace chemistry like gunshot residue, and an 83% drop in the time to analyze latent fingerprints. DePaul University is receiving the largest gift in the university's 123-year history. Game designer Eugene Jarvis is donating more than $30 million to the school's College of Computing and Digital Media. The university says Jarvis would like to keep the actual amount secret, although the largest gift in DePaul's history was $30 million back in 2012. The university says this gift exceeds that amount. That College of Computing and Digital Media offers classes in computer science, game design, film, and cybersecurity, among other focuses. It will be renamed the Eugene P. Jarvis College of Computing and Digital Media. Jarvis's spouse, Sasha Gerritsen, is a DePaul alumnus. Up next, a WTTW News investigation looking at potentially problematic donations to Illinois gubernatorial candidate Richard Irvin. Paris Schutz has details right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. The state's wealthiest resident, Ken Griffin, has bet big on Aurora Mayor Richard Irvin. Irvin is running for governor in the Republican primary for a chance to take on incumbent Democrat J.B. Pritzker and has vowed to be stronger on crime and to bring transparency and good government to the state. But Irvin's own tenure in Aurora is raising questions about whether political donations to him influence the awarding of tens of millions in municipal contracts. Paris Schutz has been investigating this story, which you can read in its entirety on our website. And Paris joins us now with more. Paris. 
Yeah, Brandis, Ken Griffin has gone all in on the two-term mayor of Aurora in his bid to become governor of Illinois. He's deposited $20 million into Irvin's gubernatorial campaign. He's praised Irvin's biography, and he's pledged that Irvin will clean up waste and corruption in Springfield. But as you mentioned, Irvin's mayoral political funds have received hundreds of thousands of dollars in contributions from companies that wound up getting tens of millions in benefits from the city of Aurora. One company that stood out, an Aurora-based telecommunications firm called Scientel Solutions. Now we found that it has donated more than $135,000 to funds connected to Irvin. That includes $67,000 to Irvin's mayoral committee. Many of those donations were routed through Scientel's CEO, his spouse, and Scientel employees. Scientel also gave $68,000 to a political action committee connected to Irvin called Build Our Future. That committee is run by Irvin's mayoral campaign manager, Dennis Cook. In Paris, what has Scientel Solutions received in Irvin's term? Brandis, namely $3.2 million in city contracts dealing with tech and security cameras. And also, Irvin was instrumental in pushing approval for Scientel to build a 195-foot communications tower on its site. Now, the Aurora City Council initially voted it down. It was controversial because they feared it would interfere with another broadcast tower right across the street, that one owned by a company called Cyrus One. That tower is connected to a data center that houses the electronic trading platform for the CME Group, read the Merck. That's the largest derivatives market in the country. So trading firms want to have antennas close to there so they can pull off what's called high frequency trades. Now, what is that? That is where computer algorithms do a high volume of trades and they get information and execute those trades quicker than their competitors because they have the technology like those microwave antennas and they can beat fiber optic cable or regular internet, internet in nanoseconds. So fast forward three months after lobbying from Irvin, City Council reversed its initial vote on that tower and then voted to approve Scientel's tower. Now, a 2019 Bloomberg article said that that tower would indeed be used for high frequency trading and speculated that the firm using it would be Citadel Securities. That, of course, is the firm owned by Ken Griffin. Now, Citadel declined comment when asked if they were using this tower, and Scientel, in a written response, simply said that it was, quote, not accurate. And as for Scientel's contributions to Irvin, the company's CEO, Nelson Santos, wrote us that there are no connections between benefits and contributions. He said, quote, all of Scientel's contracts went through a competitive bid process managed by a third party in which the third party made the recommendations to city staff who then selected Scientel as the prime. These decisions are generally made on the basis of the applicant's experience and pricing. And Irvin has said he never talks to companies about campaign donations, but a former Aurora alderman who did run for mayor against Irvin in 2021 says he believes this does not pass the smell test. It doesn't look good. I mean, it just doesn't look good for Aurora. It's just, it's just whether it's legal or not, um, it just doesn't look good. I think it's wrong. And Lofty says he had proposed contribution limits in Aurora, but that proposal got shot down. Now, this is not the first time that some of these donations and high profile contracts have received scrutiny. In 2018, the Aurora Beacon News documented Scientel and several other companies that gave big to Irvin and also won several million dollars in city benefits. And as you mentioned, Brandis, there's much more on this story on our website. Yeah, uh, some good reporting there, Paris. Thank you. Thanks, Brandis. The city council welcomed its newest member with a warm applause today. 11th Ward Alderperson Nicole Lee is a Chinatown native and Chicago's first Chinese American city council member. She spoke after being sworn into office. Take a look. I know that I'm in exactly the right place at the right time. Um, at this time in history, to be a part of this body, to help lead this great city, as well as to represent every single member of the 11th Ward, the storied 11th Ward of the city of Chicago. WTTW News reporter Heather Sharon was there. She joins us now here with more. So Heather, obviously a very historic day for the city. Remind us who Nicole Lee is and how her confirmation to Chicago Alderperson came to be. 
Well, her family has deep roots in Chinatown. And as you said, she is the first Chinese American to serve on the city council. She's only the second Asian American to serve on the city council. And she is the first Asian American woman. She replaces convicted former alderman Patrick Daly Thompson, who was removed from the city council 42 days ago after he was convicted on seven federal charges. She faces, as she said today, a steep learning curve as she gets up to speed now that she's in office. Okay, so uh, moving on to a little bit of other news. The mayor had a proposal for gas tax relief. Heather, you were able to ask her about that today. What came of it? Well, she says that there just wasn't, she's just not ready to unveil it yet. I asked her if she was concerned that waiving the city's share of the gas tax could create a deficit in the city's road maintenance fund. She said simply, no, but we're not clear what she's going to propose, even though she wants it to have maximum input on Chicago families struggling to fill up their cars and trucks and SUVs with gas. Okay, don't we all know it? All right, Heather Sharon, I'm sure there'll be more reporting from you on that. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Brandis. And we're back with more right after this. Certainly we can celebrate, but we also have to recognize what so many people have gone through because of racism and what people continue to go through. I think that Americans are finally beginning to embrace that we are African, we are indigenous, we are European, we are Asian, we are everything. Earlier this month, Chicago began seeing a slight uptick in COVID cases. Top Chicago public health officials say that the BA2 Omicron subvariant will be making up most of Chicago cases by the end of the month. But how does the subvariant compare to the BA1 that set records in the city? Joining us with an answer to that and much more is Dr. Richard Novak, the head of disease or the head of division of infectious diseases at UI Health. Dr. Novak, welcome back. So uh, the Chicago Commissioner of Public Health, Dr. Allison Arwady, says that this current increase in cases isn't quite cause uh, for alarm with this this subvariant. What's your take? Uh, I, I think that she's probably right. I'm hopeful that she's right. Uh, this variant is uh, a, little, a bit more contagious than the BA1 variant, about 30% more contagious. Uh, we're hopeful that people who have been vaccinated and boosted will still have a, a reasonable protection against this variant as well. People who have had Omicron infections already are also somewhat protected from this one as well. So hopefully it won't... Uh, turn into the same thing that Omicron did. How is this subvariant? How, how does this one compare to its parent variant, the Omicron variant that we know so much about at this point? Well, uh, as I said, it's about 30% more uh, contagious. Uh, we, uh, we do have information from Europe that shows that uh, people who are uh, who have been exposed to Omicron are much less likely to get the BA2 variant, although it's not impossible. There are a rare cases of people getting a second infection. Mostly it's in people who are unvaccinated. We also know from uh, from European studies and some studies here that people who have been vaccinated and boosted uh, do have immunity against uh, both Omicron and the BA2 variant. I hasten to add that the immunity seems to be a little less against the BA2 variant than the BA1 or the original Omicron. That might might be uh, what's contributing to the idea of giving a, a second booster at this stage. Now you've mentioned it, but you know we know that it's been surging in other countries, uh, in Europe uh, and Hong Kong. Are those other nations? Uh, what indication do we have about how what's happening there, how it might impact us here? Yes, well, uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, uh, the degree of vaccination and uh, and level of immunity in the community. So we know in the United States, uh, the level of immunity is considerably higher than in some Asian countries. And, um, and so we're hopeful that we won't see much of a bump here. We had a big wave of Omicron, and so immunity to Omicron is contributing to a lot of the relative immunity against the BA2 variant. Uh, but I think uh, what we see, we're seeing some uh, increases now, and it's gonna be mostly in people who are unvaccinated. Uh, uh, but there's a concern that your uh, immunity might wane, particularly your vaccinated 
uh, four to six months ago. And so uh, increasing immunity uh, might be useful, per particularly for people who are at high higher risk. So uh, we know that breakthrough infections were pretty common with that first wave of Omicron. Um, how well do the vaccines stand up to BA2? You've talked about the possibility of a second booster. So what do we know here? Yeah, well, um, the immunity does uh, work uh, well against Omicron and also BA2 with the existing vaccines, uh, but immunity wanes and particularly after, uh, four to six months after the last dose, there's a greater risk of, uh, of getting an infection. Hopefully the infection will be mild and we do know that the vaccines do protect people from having serious illness that would put them in the hospital. Uh, but uh, immunity does wane and it's a little less effective against the BA2 variant than it is against the original Omicron. And so uh, there's been an increasing interest in the idea of giving a second booster are we expecting any guidance from the CDC on that? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, the, the truth is the, the CDC is going to make a, an announcement that it's basically, uh, while they're not endorsing a, a second booster, they're okay with, with people uh, who are at greater risk getting another booster. And, and the reason they're hesitant is because there's not a lot of research yet on a second booster. The little that we know is uh, based on studies done in Israel, which showed that the immunity did improve dramatically with another boost. But what, uh, and we do know that when you give an additional boost, you get better titers against Omicron and, and in turn against uh, the BA2 variant. Although there's very little information about that. And, and, and frankly, we don't know that that translates into a lower risk of infection, although it's likely that that's true. But any hesitancy by the CDC to make a recommendation is because we just don't have a lot of proof yet. So uh, Chicago, we know that it's, the city is planning to roll back some parts of its at-home vaccination program. The gift card incentives, uh, mask and uh, vaccine requirements in public places have been rolled back. Are there any concerns? Do you have any concerns that some of these uh, rollbacks might contribute to our next spike? Uh, well, yes, frankly, I do. I, uh, I think that um, we were uh, we run the risk of having an increase in cases as we roll back protections. And, and this is a moving target. Uh, we won't know until more time passes if, if those recommendations have to change. Uh, everybody's hopeful that we're not gonna have much of a problem with, with the BA2 variant and we can go about our lives, but, but things could change and we may have to backtrack again. Let's, let's hope that doesn't happen. Fingers crossed. Uh, Dr. Richard Novak at UI Health, thanks again for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Up next, local efforts to help Ukrainian refugees who've arrived in Chicago. But first, a look at the weather. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine a little over a month ago, an estimated 10 million Ukrainians have been displaced by the conflict. That's roughly a quarter of the population. Millions have already fled the country to the safety of neighboring nations like Poland, Moldova and Slovakia. But while most are expected to remain in Europe, President Biden said last week that the U.S. will accept 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. And in Chicago, some have already arrived with thousands more expected to follow. Joining us now are Matthew Sorens, U.S. Director of Church Mobilization and Advocacy for World Relief. That's a nonprofit providing services for Ukrainian refugees coming to the United States, as well as help for those refugees in Europe displaced by the war. And Anna Cirilli, principal at St. Nicholas Cathedral School in Chicago's Ukrainian Village neighborhood. The school has already welcomed 20 students fleeing the war in Ukraine. And thank you to you both for joining us. Anna Cirilli, let's start with you, please. As we just said, you've welcomed 20 Ukrainian students to your school. How did they come to Chicago so quickly and how did they come to your school? So everyone that's already arrived had visas that were already in the works, maybe something that they had started like a year ago or whatever. 
So they, they knew that they were going to need these visas. <clears throat> they came on either like a tourist visa or a student visa. Um, some of them were able to get that sort of expedited in the last few weeks, but everyone that was here already has a visa. That, so they're not really considered part of like the refugees that the U.S. is about to accept. Gotcha. So, you know, obviously students and their families, they've experienced a great deal of trauma in these last few weeks. What kind of support are you able to provide? Yeah. And, and even though they're arriving here on, with the visas, right, they still had the hair, like the stories of walking to Poland for a week or, you know, for nine hours, depending on their situation. Um, and so when, when they arrive, they have nothing. They literally have the clothes on their back. Maybe they have one or two changes of clothes. So what we do is we bring them into like a room that has everything they need from school supplies, toiletries, toys, clothes, everything you can think of, even gift cards so that they can go grocery shopping and have what they need for that day for the upcoming week. Um, and all of that is being provided by all the community members that have been reaching out in ways and trying to find ways to support us and support these students. Matthew Sorens, what kind of work is World Relief doing uh, to support Ukrainian refugees here in Chicago, but of course elsewhere? Yeah, so World Relief has been receiving refugees for, for many years, including from Ukraine. In fact, um, we've, as an organization, resettled nationally about 38% of the Ukrainian refugees who've come in in the last 10 years, um, mostly to California and Washington State, but some here into Chicagoland, about 160. Uh, those, the formal resettlement program was actually put on pause because of the invasion. Um, we even had some people who were in process with flights were canceled by, by the government. But with President uh, Biden's announcement last week, we're hopeful that we'll see some of those uh, cases rescheduled. And um, we don't know exactly how many refugees will be coming through the resettlement program to Chicagoland. Um, but we hope it'll be a, you know, a significant number, and especially with the concern for family reunification. So that's one, one way we're responding. We're working with churches and community organizations to very much, like Anna said, welcome people in, make sure that they have what they need, make sure they have housing and can find jobs. But we're also responding in Europe as well. World Relief is working with uh, both local partners, a lot of local churches, as well as international partners, uh, both in Western Ukraine, as in as well as in a number of the neighboring European countries where those roughly three and a half to four million refugees have, have fled to with basic humanitarian needs, um, helping people um, with food, with um, shelter, with transportation on to other destinations as they need it. So we're really responding there and here. And Matthew, we know that the visa process, it is not typically a very speedy one. What is the process like to bring refugees here? Yeah, I think some people might have the situation from Afghanistan fresh in their minds. That was only seven to eight months ago. And that is actually not a good case study in how this normally works. That was a very unique evacuation where people fled Kabul and within a few weeks were here in Chicago. Um, what's much more typical, frankly, is people would flee a conflict and wait in that second country. So for Ukrainians, it'd be Poland or Moldova or Slovakia, often for months or even years. And um, that's uh, that's one reason that while we are really eager to welcome Ukrainians who are being able to be reunited to family, absolutely eager to do so. We also want to encourage the U.S. government to make sure that they're not forgetting people who have been stuck in camps for 10 or 20 years as well. But as a country, we need to figure out how to rebuild the resettlement program overall to welcome refugees from Ukraine, but also from Syria, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, from Burma, from Afghanistan, and from many, many other conflicts that maybe have gone out of the news headlines. But the, those conflicts are still often unresolved, and people are often still waiting in, in camp situations or as urban refugees with the hope of resettlement to the U.S. So you're saying a lot more work needs to be done with regard to that particular program. Um, Anna Cirilli, any idea about how many students you can anticipate and, and how many can you take? Right. So originally I had said 50. I mean, we're already almost halfway there and we're four weeks into this process. Um, so, you know, as the numbers grow um, and they seem to be growing rather quickly just in the last few days, um, we'll, we'll reassess, you know, what we can do. Before COVID, our numbers were, you know, high, so higher than they are now. So we were very flexible within that 50 that I first said. Um, if we are able to take additional people, it would just require me bringing on some more people on staff. We're fortunate that we already have more than a handful of staff that speak Ukrainian here. So the onboarding process is fairly, you know, quick and easy and um, easy for the families as well. So, you know, it would just mean bringing on just more staff and potentially, you know, we could take on another 50 on top of that. And then once we get higher into like a 
you know, 100 number, 150, 200 is when I just need to assess, like, what does that look like into spilling into new classrooms and hiring new staff, equipping those classrooms with the necessary materials for a safe learning environment. A lot of work, obviously, uh, that lies ahead for those of you who are supporting those refugees. Uh, our thanks uh, to our guests, Anna Cirilli and Matthew Sorens, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Monday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. You can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. And join me tonight at 8 for our next virtual community conversation. In honor of Women's History Month, we'll talk about the state of voting rights in the country. Looking back at the 19th Amendment, who was and wasn't included in that legislation, and how voting rights are changing today. Again, that is tonight at 8 p.m. For more information and to RSVP, please visit WTTW.com events. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. Thanks for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm.